Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you to this uh, program on hyperspectral remote sensing in mineral exploration, which is a part of the course being run by IARS Dehradun. A very innovative program, I should say, and uh, I'm sure most of you have been benefited by what's been happening over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, all of you have been introduced to the basics of uh, hyperspectral remote sensing, namely uh, spectroscopy, imaging spectroscopy, then uh, how imaging is done, how to process hyperspectral images, and perhaps you have also been introduced to certain applications of hyperspectral remote sensing. And today, I uh, will be telling you about uh, one of the applications which uh, perhaps is uh, the oldest application as far as hyperspectral remote sensing is concerned and that is uh, exploring for minerals that is how re hyperspectral remote sensing can assist in exploring minerals in a better way and I am Sanjeevi professor uh, of geology uh, in Anna University Chennai. So that's my to topic, hyperspectral remote sensing in mineral exploration. You all know that, uh, welcome back to this session on hyperspectral remote sensing in mineral exploration. As I was telling you earlier, you have been exposed to most parts of uh, the course related to hyperspectral remote sensing in which you probably started with fundamentals which included uh, imaging sorry spectroscopy and its uh, fundamentals then uh, imaging spectroscopy then image processing related to hyperspectral remote sensing all these things have been told to you by very eminent people and uh, I am here today to tell you about one of the applications I should say one of the potential applications of hyperspectral remote sensing namely mineral exploration uh, why this is being told to you if you ask me the question, there are a couple of reasons for that and the first thing is uh, minerals are really very important for a nation to grow and we need uh, to know many techniques, many good techniques to explore for them, that's fun. And number two is that hyperspectral remote sensing is a tool or a technique that really started off when people were looking for a good technique to explore for minerals. So this is a very potential tool I should say that is why this is being taught to you. Right. Now before going into the subject per se, I think I should start with uh, telling you what really are minerals, what is the importance of minerals. I am doing this because um, most of you listening to this uh, EDUSAT program may not be people really into mineral exploration. I mean may not be uh, geologists by uh, profession but uh, may be interested in knowing what are the different applications of hyperspectral remote sensing. Okay. So for that, let us start with what really is a mineral, uh, if you know what a mineral is or uh, if you could know what is the significance of a mineral. Now what you are seeing on the screen is a pencil which uh, most of us use uh, in our daily life. But what you may not know is that there are many minerals that are being used to make this particular pencil which is perhaps a very simple material. You may think it is a very simple material starting from the tip namely the lead as we generally call it, it is not the lead but it is the graphite to the eraser in the, in the end. Everything in this pencil is has something to do with minerals in it. And if you ask me what are they, it is here a very clear picture. The tip is made up of graphite which is a mineral found uh, below the surface of earth and we mix clay with it to make it soft and to write with and the wooden casing is uh, made, uh, uh, is given a shape by using tools which are made from iron and the paint, iron and steel and the paint that is used to, uh, to give a color to the pencil is also uh, the pigments are uh, gained from the mother earth that is the, they are also minerals and then the eraser here is made up of uh, petroleum which again is a mineral and the metal that links the pencil and the eraser is made up of brass which is again made up of zinc and copper, copper which are metals uh, which come from minerals. So a simple pencil has got a very solid mineralogical background uh, in it to it I should say. If that is the case 
think of the train we travel the bus we travel this chair we sit on and uh, anything and everything you have in and uh, around your house everything has got mineral in it so to make our life easy and to make our life go on minerals have a big role to play but uh, these are materials that are not directly exposed to the earth surface and uh, we need to keep on looking for them and for many centuries human beings have tried to look for minerals but of late it has been thought that remote sensing could be a potential tool and within remote sensing hyperspectral remote sensing is perhaps a very good tool to look for minerals about that only we are going to see today and uh, this is the topic in general i should say mineral exploration about which i am going to talk to you and uh, most of you who have undergone a course on uh, remote sensing must have been told that remote sensing as such can assist in mineral exploration to isolate potential ore bearing provinces uh, based on uh, something we already know suppose i know where i know occurs or in what rocks i know occurs i i can use satellite images and look at similar rocks rocks and check whether i know occurs in them similarly you all know that remote sensing can reduce the cost of exploration uh, by focusing more on the detailed ground based studies and uh, not only that we can cover a very large area this this all we know but uh, what we are going to see today is not simply remote sensing in the normal sense but a very latest tool people pro- prefer to call it as the 21st century tool for resource management and that is hyperspectral remote sensing uh, that's a general term or using hyperspectral imaging it's to be specific and uh, i would prefer to call it as the eighth sense of a geologist you all must be knowing that uh, uh, a human being has uh, just five senses but the sixth sense is something what a normal person may not have and if a human being is able to sense beyond his ca- capability we say he has got the sixth sense then we, co- we in remote sensing if a human being is able to see a very large area let us say 100 km by 100 km area in one shot that is by using remote sensing then we say the human being has got a seventh sense but if the same human being is able to get all the spectral details which is normal eyes cannot get from a very big area then we say he has got an eighth sense that by that in that context i should say that uh, have spectral uh, remote sensing can be considered to be a the eighth sense of a geologist and using this uh, uh, technology what has been realized that we have now almost written off the era of simply looking at pictures taking pictures and describing them we no longer do that in hyperspectral sensing we do a lot of measurement what is the measurement uh, i'm talking about we t- we talk of what is the material contain that is present in an area how much is how much of that material is present in an area we we do all this using hyperspectral sensing of the earth and uh, all of you must be knowing that uh, india has launched uh, its own satellite to the moon namely chandrayaan and in that also hyperspectral remote sensing has been used in a very big way and that's why the last statement here we can also sense the moon surface using hyperspectral remote sensing looking for minerals on the moon so what i am going to tell you today is an overview of how hyperspectral remote sensing can be used to assist in mineral exploration very successfully it has been done and uh, before we really go into that as i told you it's possible that most of you or uh, some of you who are listening to this lecture are perhaps not geologists by background and you may be wondering what really a mineral is so by definition if you see a mineral is an element or chemical compound that is normally crystalline and that has formed as a result of geological process is a very simple statement i should say but it was realized that uh, minerals not simply are not simply result of geological processes they can also be formed due to biogeochemical process even uh, animals can lead to certain formation of certain minerals iron ores are an example so there is another definition of a mineral is a naturally occurring solid chemical substance formed through biogeochemical processes 
and having characteristic chemical composition please uh, make a note of this having a character chemical composition is going to be very important and then having highly ordered atomic structure and specific specific physical properties why i said you need, you need to take a note of that particular point having a characteristic chemical composition is because if you recall all of those who have been attending this course regularly couple of weeks back you were introduced to spectroscopy isn't it as a part of hyperspectral remote sensing you were introduced to the concept of spectroscopy and there you were told that the main factors that uh, control or that influence the reflectance characteristics because whenever we talk of uh, uh, remote sensing we talk of reflectance and absorption of materials and uh, the main factors that influence the reflectance characteristics of a substance are chemical composition of the substance the size of the substance or texture or particle size all these things i which has already been told to you isn't it so that tells us that uh, if you are going to look at minerals look at rocks and look at uh, talk about their spectral reflectance then we are going to talk about the chemical composition which really governs the spectral reflectance okay so this takes us to another terminology called spectral geology which i think i thought i should uh, tell you in the beginning itself what exactly is uh, meant by spectral geology this is a term which uh, really means that uh, it is the measurement and analysis of certain portions of the electromagnetic re uh, region or radiation in order to identify spectrally distinct and physically significant features of different rock types their mineralogy and alteration signatures now those of you who are geologists here will definitely understand the meaning of the word alternative signatures alteration signatures and for those who have not heard this term so far i can tell that rocks and minerals undergo lot of uh, alteration due to many reasons all of the natural due to sunlight due to weathering due to uh, steam and gases from the earth's uh, interior and then due to heat many things have uh, happened to rocks and minerals they uh, they undergo alteration and this alteration could lead to concentration of certain minerals and metals and if you are going to sense these altered regions using remote sensing and that is what is known as spectral geology now talking about spectral geology all of you have seen what really is the spectral signature of different materials uh, natural materials on the earth surface namely water and then vegetation soil wet soil dry soil all those signatures spectral signatures you have seen and uh, talking about spectral signatures of minerals here is a set of spectral signature of minerals if you see what you are seeing on the screen you have if you see in the visible portion not much is really happening if you see for iron ore it is red in color you know most of the most of us know that iron ore is red in color that's why you see there's a peak in the red uh, reflectance region and then calcite is a bright material so it is uh, having very high reflectance in all regions but look at the don't look at the nir but look at the middle infrared or short wave in this region if you see there are too many absorptions very sharp absorptions at very narrow wavelengths if you see in 1400 then then here if you see see for kyanite there is something here there is there is what is known as a doublet here and there is a very sharp and strong absorption for carbonate for calcite that means at uh, 2.3 uh, uh, microns so many things are happening especially in this region this tells us that and uh, more than that if you can see calcite or uh, limestone limestone is a very important mineral which human beings are using almost every day to manufacture cement and then iron ore or hematite we are using mainly to manufacture steel and uh, if you are looking at other minerals copper lead and zinc metals associated with uh, hydrothermally altered regions the indicators of hydrothermally altered regions are certain types of clays namely smectite montmorillonite kyanite and all these things and for them we have certain specific absorptions so now you will understand that the hyperspectral remote sensing can easily identify these sharp uh, contrast in their absorption characteristics of these materials so if it is possible to identify these sharp contrasts 
that is namely sharp reflectance or uh, very distinct absorptions then it is possible for us to identify mineralization that is occurring in a place this is what this particular spectral reflectance curve really indicates now looking at the spectra of other minerals that are there on the earth's surface or below the surface if you can see hematite is an ore of iron and you can see that it has got a red peak if you see here then it has got a quite a, a good trough in the nir region at uh, to be specific at 865 nanometers uh, iron oxide uh, rich materials have got a strong uh, to, uh, hematite to be specific not uh, magnetite but hematite to be specific has got a good good uh, absorption jarosite is another ore of iron it has got a broad trough goethite limonite and why basic rocks is written here is basic rocks are iron containing rocks they are not ores of iron so hematite is an ore of iron whereas basic rocks are iron containing rocks and you can see that as the amount of iron decreases from hematite to basic rocks as they come down through jarosite goethite limonite and basic rock the iron content iron oxide content is decreasing and you see the width of the trough is becoming wider and wider so this is perhaps a very good observation you can make uh, with respect to the wavelength region not only that look at the center of the trough for pure iron iron ore or very high quality iron ore namely hematite it is at 865 nanometers but jarosite it has moved uh, towards a longer wavelength that means lesser iron the trough moves towards longer wavelength goethite further limonite further and basic rocks for, to, towards further uh, longer wavelengths so this indicates that it is possible for us to tell about the quality of an iron ore just by looking at its spectral signature similarly this uh, what you see here sharp troughs for montmorillonite gypsum quartz there are many minerals which are having characteristic absorption features uh, that are sharp at very narrow wavelengths meaning if you need to identify these materials which are indicative of mineralization then you need to have hyperspectral sensing in your hand only then you can identify this mineralization see for kyanite uh, what you see here is a typical doublet for kyanite at 1400 region montmorillonite also muscovite so you see the difference though all the three are similar in terms of the character they have they have the h2o and also they are basically aluminum aluminum hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide materials and other things are also there but you see the difference in their spectral signature or what i would say as fingerprint instead of spectral signature it's quite specific and we can easily identify them look at a carbonate rich material calcite is calcium carbonate uh, dolomite is calcium magnesium carbonate magnesite is magnesium carbonate and siderite is iron carbonate whatever these may be the common thing here is they are all carbonates and whichever material has got carbonate in it will have a very strong absorption at 2350 nanometers and that's very clear here so if you are a geologist trying to explore for calcite maybe to set up or limestone to set up a cement factory somewhere in a district what you could do is you could uh, take an hyperspectral sensor which is sensitive in the 2200 to 2500 region and with uh, 50 or 60 bands fit it in your aircraft make a very low flight and look at the image or band uh, uh, pertaining to 2350 re, um, uh, nanometer region and whichever pixels are dark in color meaning they are absorbing that energy there definitely carbonate would be there that means it's a limestone rich area so that's how we can try to link this particular image or this particular picture to uh, exploration for uh, carbonate minerals similarly for uh, silicates we have another story we have too many things happening as as regards uh, the absorption however this absorption is more prominent in the thermal region of the electromagnetic spectrum so visible to short wave infrared may not be really helpful to identify silicates autoclaves or albite or uh, on blend other things however if you can think of hyperspectral sensing in the thermal region perhaps this task could become easier the example continues you have uh, many more uh, features for calcite 
hematite and other things in uh, the thermal region also meaning that you could also do if you are capable of doing hyperspectral sensing at the thermal region you can try to identify minerals more accurately more perfectly here is a set of spectral signature curves for certain one set of minerals the names are alunite dikite kyolinite muscovite tourmaline actinolite uh, these names for, to geologists are names associated with hydrothermally altered rocks that means rocks that are really rich in minerals base metals and many uh, uh, copper deposit porphyry deposits many many deposits have been uh, uh, topped or associated with hydrothermally altered regions and these minerals are those present in such hydrothermally altered regions so what i am trying to say is if you could do an hyperspectral sensing of a region which has been hydrothermally altered and which is perhaps mineralogically rich then what you can do is if you get signatures of this kind in that area then you can be very sure that there is very good mineralization occurring there similarly you have you see the signatures for many other uh, iron rich samples in different wavelengths then alunite which is again an uh, mineral associated with hydrothermally altered regions that again has got what is known as a typical uh, doublet or a triplet to be specific in in the 1400 uh, sorry 1420 to 1500 region it is there you can easily pick it out and tell that we have hydrothermally altered mineralization happening there and then for kyolinite you have such signatures you see here the specific signatures at narrow wavelengths which are not perhaps there for other minerals and uh, whatever minerals i am showing now they are all in the uh, minerals associated or they are part of the assemblage of hydrothermally altered regions halosite you can see how distinct signatures you have even though they are from different places one is in the us one is in the france but but the signatures are almost same they are saying that uh, anywhere in the world if you get such signatures probably it indicates the presence of halosite and you could perhaps associate some kind of mineralization there then montmorillonite light you see the signature dikite you see a doublet here and a doublet here and a singlet here uh, maybe a little carbonate is also present there possible and then spectrite illite we talk of clays swelling clays and non swelling clays civil engineers may be interested in this if you want to identify you can look for illite or spectrite and tell where really there is uh, such clays present and uh, if you see here this is taken from a website wherein you see the absorptions associated with hydroxyl ions water vapor, water and then again hydroxyl ions in the 1900 region and then water in the 1900 region alumina hydroxide in the 2200 region iron hydroxide in the 2200 200 uh, 22 uh, 2250 region then 2300 you have magnesium hydroxide and carbonates as i already told you the also for alumina you have one more at 2400 so there are many specific narrow wavelength regions which are typically associated with such compounds that are, that uh, indicate mineralization maybe uh, occurrence of bauxite or limestone or base metals whatever it is okay so this is how we can link hyperspectral sensing to identify indicator minerals Okay, indicator minerals are there, but what is the kind of deposit you are going to look at? To know that, first we should know what are the types of mineral deposits. Maybe this is more like a flashback. First I told you remote sensing, then I am going to... Uh, I should have started with the types of mineral deposits, but it would have become, become a typical uh, um, geology lecture. I didn't want it, it to be that way, so I thought I will tell you about mineral deposits now, rather than in the beginning. Mineral deposits uh, are fundamentally two types, primary mineral deposits and secondary mineral deposits within primary that means originally formed i should say that's called primary we have two types one is called the syngenetic that is mineral deposits that are formed simultaneously with the surrounding host rock that means when the rock is formed the deposit is formed at the same time that's called syngenetic and epigenetic means forms subsequent to the rock suppose a rock is there then it may be cracked up there may be fractures there may be veins and these veins and fractures could get could get filled by mineral rich fluids 
and the rock would get replaced by these uh, minerals and that is called an epigenetic mineralization or epigenetic deposit. Secondary mineral deposits are those which are associated with chemical or mechanical alteration of the pre-existing deposit by surface weathering. And it is such minerals that are frequently marked by surface indicators. All the clay minerals and other things which I was telling in the previous slides, they are typically associated with secondary minerals and they, they are easily discernible on remote sensing images or discernible by remote sensing instruments. So, as a general statement, we can say that uh, remote sensing is a valuable tool for mineral exploration. You must have heard of people trying to uh, draw a linear mineral map, trying to associate uh, minerals with that, trying to map the local fracture pattern, trying to associate mineralization with that, trying to prepare a geological map, trying to associate minerals with different rock types. All that can be done with a regular multispectral image set. But what is it that we are going to get from hyper, hyperspectral image sets? We are going to actually map hydrothermally altered rocks only using uh, hyperspectral images. So that's why I marked it in red here. Uh, we are going to tell you how you are going to use rem hyperspectral remote sensing, not regular remote sensing in uh, mineral exploration. And for that, first we should know what is it that we are going to look for when you look for min uh, minerals. We are going to look for the rocks. For example, if I were to say, where will you find coal or which is the rock that is going to be associated with coal, it is almost certain that almost 100% of the coal bearing rocks in the world maybe lignite or anthracite or bituminous coal, whatever it is, they are associated only with sedimentary rocks. So, if you are going to look for coal, first we start looking for sedimentary rocks. So, I cannot be looking for coal in Maharashtra, that is basalt area. I can be looking only in the sandstone area, right? So, sandstone of a given age, that is why we say the stratigraphical and lithological data we need and this could be a guide to locate minerals and a certain minerals like diamond and certain uh, in some places gold and uh, other placer deposits and uh, bauxite also they are geomorphologically controlled the landforms are indicative of minerals and then in some places it is the faults and fractures that unfolds that have minerals in them we call them as structural guides and in some places altered rocks or rock alteration can be a guide to look for minerals and in some places people try to look at the plants that are growing there and these plants are sometimes associated with a particular metal that is ex, uh, that is in excess in the soil. So, looking at the plant, we can tell that there is a metal type, particular type of metal present there, hence we can start exploring for the metal below that area. What I have marked in red here is a point or a guide which can be best understood by hyperspectral remote sensing. Stratigraphical, lithological, geomorphological, structural and geobotanical. These guides could easily be studied using an ordinary multispectral image. But rock alteration can be best studied by uh, hyperspectral image. Okay, so I told you about structural guides, stratigraphic guides, lithologic guides and geomorphic guides and also ge uh, geobotanical guides. But rock alteration guides are the ones which really are associated with hyperspectral uh, remote sensing because there we are going to look for alteration zones which are marked by hydrothermal mineral occurrences. Okay? Now, these alteration zones are again typical of all those minerals I told you. Alunite, Dickite, Smectite, Montmorillonite, Iron Oxide, okay? Carbonates, Sulphates. So, once you have, you know what is going to occur in an alteration zone, you can try to relate that to a particular region of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. So, mo most of the time in the past when people use remote sensing to map uh, alteration zones, uh, when I say past I mean the multispectral era, what they did was they simply identified alteration zones as a ringed uh, uh, halo in an image which is perhaps an indicator of uh, alteration in the rock 
or they produce the color ratio composites from the visible and the near infrared images or from short wave infrared images and i'm showing you an example of that uh, here you see here what is uh, see this is uh, an area in in the us where uh, this has been taken from a standard textbook you have six uh, bands of uh, tm and you can see the blue band is there the green band is there the red band is there uh, reflected ir one reflected ir two and the uh, the, the, the three short uh, this is the short wave image and in this area if you look at the geological map which is shown to the right you can see that it has got uh, the alluvium it is called the volcanic rocks is a tough unaltered country rock the white one and the hydrothermally altered country rock is the uh, diagonal hash what you see here these are the ones okay so if you can mark this place you can if you can identify this place or these regions which are hydrothermally altered so only in that, that region ore deposits will occur that is for certain if you see the geological map it shows the dark black ones are the ore deposits which are definitely occurring in this area okay so how does it look in the image if you see in band 1 the white patch is the alteration not so clear see in band 2 band 3 band 4 band 5 and band 6 so band 5 and band 6 are more towards the short wave and i told you about the curves for minerals the curves are more active in the short wave regions okay for uh, hydrothermal region. so you can see the values here are better right how it looks now if i were to make a ratio you see i took the highest value and the lowest value that's what used to be done and this is please remember this is a multi spectral data set and the ratio was taken uh, band 5 by 7 and see the output you can see the hydrothermal altered regions compare this output to this image the hydrothermally altered region has come out very well so this is an old story taken from a standard textbook but what i want you to look here is though they have taken a multi spectral band band 7 what has been missing is it is a an average of uh, a doublet a reflectance you see so many things are happening in a brown band area so had it, it would have been nice if you had a narrow band looking only at the trough portion not the peak and other things isn't it that was not possible 20 years back but now it is possible so what i'm trying to say if the same ratioing is done but using a hyperspectral band definitely the this uh, image the output would be more accurate more closely matching to the geological map okay similarly for other ratio also only broadband ratios were done and they got this output this is mainly to tell you that if and these days we, we we are not just having seven bands or six bands we have many more bands such ratios could be better and by doing such things what are we going to identify we are going to identify these minerals iron and magnesium oxides rare earths hydroxyls carbonates sulfates mica amphiboles carbonates and silicates now all these are associated with hydrothermally altered regions and if you could see the wavelength region in which their response is typical you have the visible to near infrared short wave 1100 to 2500 and also thermal you have you for carbonates and silicates is there okay now what is what are the list of minerals that could be looked in the short wave region you see biotite actinolite sericite chlorite the pyrophyllite alunite tourmaline topaz pinopyrite all are indicators of intrusion intrusion related mineralization and then kyanite dikite diaspor montmorillonite calcite chlorite all are typical of high sulfidation epithermal deposits of uh, minerals typically in advanced argillic acid sulfate environments and then sericite so the list is quite big and if you see the last column and the first column you can always relate different environment of formation of minerals including vms volcanogenic massive sulfide minerals and typically gold and other things which are again you have to look for such minerals only okay so if you start looking for these you can definitely identify these mineral deposits and how do you look for this because these have these minerals are having typical narrow band absorptions which we have already seen i showed you many curves so how is it possible to identify those curves those absorptions only using hyperspectral sensing not using 
multi-spectral sensing. So that is why I am showing you this uh, table. Like that uh, if you see mean, uh, another table everything related to either gold or uranium or uh, all types of minerals but the indicators are here. Minerals that are typically active in the shortwave infrared region with very narrow wavelength absorptions and which can definitely be uh, highlighted only using hyperspectral sensing. Okay, the list is again quite big. You can always refer this list when the presentation is passed down to you by the organizers of, organizers of this course. And uh, here is another uh, simple ready, ready recognized would say. Mineral deposits that are amenable to hyperspectral alteration mapping. Well, see, all the VMS deposits, orogenic uh, gold in quartz veins, low sulfidation epithermal gold, high sulfidation epithermal gold, sedimentary exhalative mineral deposits, intrusion related, iron oxides or copper and gold ion associated with uh, limonotic cappings, what not, everything is there, nickel, copper, including PGE, platinum group of minerals, unconformity related uranium deposits which includes uh, certain deposits in India, sediment hosted gold, everything has indicator alteration minerals which can be mapped using hyperspectral sensing. Okay, so here it is, the example which I have already shown you, right, but this is a story using multispectral, if this is a success, definitely using hyperspectral, the success could be even better, right. Now, having give, told you that when we say hyperspectral remote sensing for mineral exploration, we are only going to exploit the characteristics of minerals, certain minerals, indicator minerals, and what are these characteristics? Their narrow absorption or reflectance at specific wavelengths. So, I am going to tell you how this particular character was exploited by certain researchers, certain workers and how they have tried to extract mineral information. That is, I am going to tell you some case studies uh, just to demonstrate the success of using hyperspectral uh, images. Uh, not only images, I will also tell you about how hyperspectral radiometry was used to gather information about uh, minerals. The first uh, case study I am going to tell is a work done by a student and this relates to hyperspectral data processing to assess the grades of iron ores in parts of Novamundi and Joda in uh, eastern India. And the aim of this work as defined by the student was to assess the grades or quality of iron ores. It is an area of known mineralization of uh, hematite but the question was where do you have good quality iron ore, where do you have not so good quality iron ore and for that he has tried to use hyperspectral images and try to assess the grades and uh, for that he used the Hyperion image which uh, most of you must be aware by this time because you have already been exposed to the different satellites and sensors that provide us hyper, hyper, hyperspectral image data and you know that it has got a 242 bands but uh, we use only 196 or the student used only 196 bands. So here is the image, hyperspectral image cube of Novamundi and Joda area and what you see here is a forested area but the green patches in the FCC are all the iron ore, uh, exposed iron ores that are there available in the area along the strike you can see. So that is uh, the eastern part of India, Jharkhand and Orissa in the border you have the Novamundi and Joda iron ores and this is the banded iron ore formation BAF and the very popular uh, uh, area with uh, known deposits of iron, right. You know that uh, hyper hyperspectral images generally suffer from a lot of uh, problems related to atmospheric errors or atmospheric uh, problems and these have to be corrected. So these images were corrected radiometrically and also geometric correction was done and the resulting mineral was uh, uh, used for further processing and this correction included first removal of the bad bands. You will see that, you see this is the uh, one band you see the striping due to many reasons let us not go into that but uh, a simple image processing tool was applied and the bad bands have been removed now you see how the image looks so like this bands were identified which have the striping effect and uh, the striping uh, the striping was removed and then it was further used for atmospheric correction or radiometric correction about which uh, you have already been exposed to and uh, the correction was done and you, you could see uh, if, you, if you want to be convinced whether the correction is correct or wrong, 
what you need to see is just uh, try to look at the spectra of a barren land, spectra of vegetation, spectra of iron ore. You see what you see here, and you can, you will definitely say that these are not typical spectra of a barren land, iron ore, or vegetation. Am I right? So this was before the correction was done. That is raw, uncorrected image. Once it was corrected using various, uh, you know about various algorithms. Uh, you have flash and at core and six uh, x five s. Many things are there. Let's let's not go into that. But look at the spectra of a barren land, a exposed soil. I should say, iron ore, typical of iron ore, and vegetation, which you know is typical. Now we are convinced that the correction has been done, and then we can go ahead. So you see here the iron ore spectra, which the researcher has got from the image, is as good as the spectra. Obtained in the lab using an iron ore sample using a hyperspectral radiometer, isn't it? So that is the kind of information you can get. Okay, and you know very well that you already been told in spectroscopy also that uh, that iron ore, if it is there, there is a very strong NIR absorption. So you could see the NIR absorption here, and stronger the absorption, better is the quality of iron ore, and uh, sharp, uh, smaller is the radius of curvature. Higher is the quality of uh, iron ore. All these you have been already been told. I am going to show you how that is being applied here. And for that, what was first was then was different parts of the mines exposed mines were visited and many samples were collected in the mines. If you see the yellow dots, samples were collected from different places on the mine, and then the spectra also was taken on the mine face. On pure and uh, on different types of uh, deposits, you see here. These are the de deposits, and then the location and the type of deposits mentioned here. Okay. Having done that, from the hyperspectral image, at twenty different points, meaning twenty different qualities of iron ore, the spectra was generated from the hyperspectral image data set for the iron ore deposit as is seen here. And you see the spectra is here. This is now this is a corrected image, and if you can see these spectra are really textbook like. That means they are typically indicating an hematite. The only thing is, you see the one has got a uh, smaller radius of curvature, one has got a broad radius of, uh, radius of curvature, so the quality would differ. Okay, so very strong absorption is seen in the 850 to 950, 900 region due to the presence of iron oxide, which we all know, and from these spectral curves. It is clear that the various spectral parameters, such as radius of curvature, depth uh, of NIR absorption, position of NIR absorption, all these can be derived to assess the quality of the ore. Okay, so from the image, several spectral parameters like radius of curvature, position of the trough, depth of the absorption trough, all these were derived. See here, so this is the see NIR trough is there, isn't it? So you see, I try to fit in a. Circle there. Try to measure its radius. Smaller the radius, higher is iron ore content. That is the logic. This logic was used. Then depth. You see, if uh, the curve is on the top, that means it has got minimum depth of absorption. It is in the bottom. It has got maximum depth of absorption. Minimum depth. Lesser the depth of absorption, poorer is the quality. Larger is the depth of. Greater is the depth of absorption. Higher is the quality. You can see. So like this, we can relate. Similarly, position of NIR observed. It was observed that if the quality is poor, then the center of the trough is at a longer wavelength, and if the quality is high, then the center of the trough is at a shorter wavelength within the absorption region. That is within the 850 to 900. If the center of the trough is 850, then it is higher quality. If the center of the trough is at 900, then it is poor quality. That is the logic on which it was. Uh, this study was based. And spectral parameters, that is depth, radius of curvature, depth, and position, everything was derived for all the samples or sample points in the image, and the geochemistry of the sam samples collected almost during the same week from those when the image was taken from those points. Uh, this is there, and now you will see that there is a strong relationship between. Iron oxide content and radius of curvature. So what this means is, if you have a hyperspectral image, you simply have to generate a curve from the image for an iron ore area, 
and if the curve has got a very small radius of curvature then you can say it's got high iron ore content high quality iron ore there if it has got a very broad trough then it has got a very poor iron ore quality there like that you can say with these spectral parameters so this is what this particular study indicates the conclusion is this was describes the potential of hyperspectral remote sensing in identifying well defined absorption features of iron oxide in the nir region and we can easily categorize iron ore grades based on spectral parameters such as radius of curvature depth of the nir absorption position of nir absorption further we can also say that uh, hyperspectral data processing techniques is a must before we really attempt mineral information extraction from satellite images or hyperspectral images another uh, exam case study or example i am going to show you is how to identify magnesite deposits whether there is magnesite there and if it is there whether it is of a good quality or not how this is done you see here magnesite for those of you who don't know what it is is magnesium carbonate it is a material that is used in uh, uh, in furnaces where steel or uh, sorry iron ore is uh, melted to obtain steel so magnesite has got very high formation temperature it can withstand a very great amount of heat that's why uh, with the vessel in which uh, iron ore is to be melted is made up of magnesite and where do you get this magnesite is very difficult to say because it's not a very common mineral we have to go looking for it however india is one one of the very few countries having very good quality of magnesite but what you should know is magnesite is a product of alteration of a rock called dunite this dunite as as a rock it is just not of use to us but once it starts alterate altering the end product of altering could be alteration could be magnesite now hyperspectral uh, remote sensing can definitely tell us which is a dunite or unaltered dunite and which is a partially altered dunite and which is a fully altered dunite or which is a magnesite and uh, this has been demonstrated in this study because we are trying to look at carbonate and you know very well for carbonate you have a well defined trough at 2350 nanometers so this study was carried out in a place near salem in south india where there is an excellent deposit of magnesite and the other areas with uh, low quality magnesite is also available and there a radiometer was taken and all types of magnesite pure dunite and fully altered dunite or high quality magnesite i should say these two were and the reflectance uh, was measured and the intermediate varieties that is partially altered partial to medium altered uh, almost altered almost fully altered fully altered different stages of alteration the spectra was generated and what you can see here is you can see the typical spectra and you can see the 1400 uh, because of uh, the uh, hydroxyl ion present there uh, and uh, it is there and uh, as the alteration produce uh, proceeds you can see that the carbonate content is increasing this is uh, sharper and this is uh, broader you can see so whatever you saw in this curve here for magnesite is due to the fact that dunite alteration and conversion to magnesite produces measurable changes in the visible near infrared short wave spectra why these changes are there it is because of the fact that dunite has a transition from the silicate dominated rocky composition to carbonate dominated industrial mineral composition that is magnesite composition as tra- as the transition proceeds and this the spectra also keeps on changing so using this change in the spectral character you see how it is you see the it is a curvature you can see the position you can see the slope many things are there many spectral features are there for each of this material whether it is an uh, serpentinized dunite or sur- uh, or uh, just dunite or uh, magnesite whatever it is spectra is distinct and uh, th- these are some characters in each wavelength region you have something that can be observed using in the spectra it is listed here you can always look at this table which will be passed down to you by the organizers due to lack of time i'm proceeding in a very fast way uh, i really apologize for that but i'll continue here you see one thing was observed when you measure the radius of curvature of the carbonate trough as you would like to call it that is a 2500 uh, 2350 
nanometer region absorption which you see here which is typical of carbonate what it was observed was if the radius of curvature was high then the carbonate content was very less very simple you see the relationship and this is the inverse relationship between radius of curvature and carbonate content and a template was made what this template simply says is you can take any rock maybe dunite or partially ortho dunite or magnesite take the spectra and measure the radius of curvature of the carbonate as at 2350 region and if the radius of curvature is high that means it is region 1 pure dunite if it falls here region 2 partially altered dunite if it falls here in the end region 5 it is pure magnesite very simple you can with uh, that means you can tell about the quality of magnesite even without doing uh, geochemical analysis i'm i'm not trying to say that we should, should never do geochemical analysis but this is a very rapid manner of uh, immediately assessing the quality of magnesite just by looking at the spectra so this is again one uh, tool in uh, mineral mapping or mineral quality mapping i should say similarly the position of the trough also varies for uh, poor quality magnesite and high quality magnesite which is shown here so this study has demonstrated that it is possible to identify and rec recognize certain rocks and minerals based on spectral properties and you can easily ma map different quality identify magnesite deposit and also tell what is their quality with respect to the amount of mgco3 present there and uh, talking about carbonates i am telling you of an ongoing project wherein limestone was mapped you see this is a crystalline limestone see how the spectra of crystalline limestone looks the sharp absorption trough at 2350 however when you go to sedimentary limestone the trough is here the 2350 trough but you can see the iron oxide also present getting present clay minerals coming in in this presence and uh, the other impurities that are coming so this is perhaps more pure limestone this is impure because you see the clay typical of clay absorption everything is there so you can easily make out which is a good quality limestone which is a bad quality and not so good quality here is a comparison crystalline limestone sedimentary limestone see how the curves differ these things are not very prominent here but it is very prominent here okay the characters are listed here you can always check it later and but what i am trying to say is you can tell the amount of iron everything present they are clear right so you can differentiate different types of limestone also talk about the quality of limestone looking at the radius of curvature or depth of absorption whatever it is right so that the chemistry has been listed you can see it later and once you look at the quality using the radiometric data obtained in the field you can extend it to the image here i am showing a typical aster image aster for uh, simple reasons could be considered as a semi hyperspectral image data set because in the short wave infrared region itself it has got six bands and if you could generate the curves for limestone you can easily get you see for uh, known areas for crystalline area and for sedimentary area similar curves have been obtained from the so from image also you can tell which is a good quality limestone and which is a bad not so good quality limestone you see here for aster uh, it says that uh, for band 6 you have uh, for clay mineral discrimination and if for carbonate you have band 8 and for alumina you have uh, some bands like that it is a very good data set which can be used in the absence of a proper hyperspectral data set aster could serve as a semi hyperspectral data set for mineral exploration i'm now i'm going to show you another study wherein a an indicator namely tourmaline was tried to be identified this indicate tourmaline is an indicator of gold mineralization this was a work done in australia by phil uh, beaverth and here is an example this is the image of a place in western australia and he has indicated the gold load here you see and this is an image and he is trying he is trying to show the output here the image and the output which is due to some kind of a processing carried out uh, for uh, hyperspectral data set and he is trying to show the gold load and tourmaline rich areas which can be indicators of uh, gold mineralization he has taken the spectra of uh, tourmaline what is tourmaline it is it's written here is a group of mineral uh, mainly 
containing boron which could be indicating uh, uh, gold in certain areas okay so the spectra was taken from lab samples of tourmaline which you see here using a radiometer and he used certain processing techniques try to look at their features in different parts of the shortwave spectra and then did some processing and finally came out with this map which i already showed you and this region he says which is enlarged here is tourmaline rich area which is indicating that there is gold available here so this was possible only when he used a sensor called high map and uh, which is hyperspectral uh, image and uh, try to look for gold mineralization a success story i should say okay and he concluded that he can easily look for tourmaline species in certain areas and try to tell whether gold mineralization occurs or not similarly in south india uh, bauxite was uh, uh, studied because of its uh, typical spectra alumina has got a 2.2 micrometer absorption and uh, aster again uh, has you see the alumina occurs on uh, hill tops but not all, all hill tops are alumina rich so they have we have tried to map these bauxites if you see here these are bauxite mines and uh, a technique which you know as linear spectral unmixing which you know you see this was applied to aster image i will show you that you you have been told of spectral unmixing or subpixel classification typical of aster or uh, hyperspectral data set this technique was applied to an aster image shown here for the cappings you see the, um, you must be knowing that as uh, bauxite appears only occurs only on hill tops so one particular technique called uh, spectral unmixing which is based on this particular uh, algorithm which has already perhaps been told to you it was done and n members about which you have been told were selected for the image and uh, you see the third one or uh, sorry the yes the third one this is called the second one this is called the alumina fraction image this is what this is our end product all the white patches are those where high amount of alumina is present but what i told you is bauxite or alumina rich mineral is not present in all places it is present only on hill cappings so this was put over a dm and wherever you have red patches on the hill cappings those are rich in bauxite that was what was concluded 26 cappings were identified from the dm however only 16 coincided with the red patches which were result of hyperspectral data processing these are the 16 cappings researchers went there collected the samples and 5 1 2 3 4 5 five of the cappings turned out to be alumina rich so this is a success story of mineral exploration using hyperspectral data set so there is a conclusion that you can definitely use aster data if you don't have other uh, hyperspectral data set for uh, certain kind of mineral mapping and uh, remote sensing or hyperspectral remote sensing definitely will help to acquire very good information before ground exploration and this has been proved in this case of bauxite mineralization in kolli hills of tamil nadu right after having told that so we have seen how minerals really have a very good response in certain parts certain narrow parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and if you want to know that you have to do hyperspectral radiometry or hyperspectral sensing and if you can do proper analysis of hyperspectral images you can get very good information about the occurrence of minerals so as a concluding statement i would like to say that hyperspectral sensors and analysis of their images can provide very good information by uh, than that was possible ever before and these days we have many new sensors providing hyperspectral images to us and many new image processing algorithms are continuously being developed and hyperspectral radiometry and image processing are the two tools which we should be very familiar with and we should master them especially for mineral exploration this is what i wanted to tell you uh, within the very short time uh, sorry for the delay anyway you can always contact me at uh, my email id thanks very much for your patient listening any queries we can continue now thank you very much okay uh, 
there is a question that has come up from dst uh, sorry ranchi i think it's it says uh, for ionor mapping which band is useful from hyperion data um, i would always uh, exercise caution while using the term ion ion mapping because we have to be very careful what kind of uh, ore we are looking at if it is hematite the job is very easy when we use uh, hyperspectral data because hematite has got typical absorption oh yes uh, i'm sorry uh, we are coming back again there is a question that talks of uh, ion ore mapping uh, for for ion ore for for ion mapping which band is useful from hyperion data this is a question from ranchi and uh, the answer is not uh, a straight forward answer i should say because uh, we have to be sure what type of ion we are uh, talking because hematite has got well defined spectral characteristics very good absorption in the nir region though it is a broad absorption trough but uh, centered around 8000 uh, 865 nanometers it has got well defined trough so i would say 860 to 870 that region is good for hematite however for magnetite i should say that uh, the spectral response is not really well defined i have seen people saying that magnetite also has if you look at uh, roger clark's uh, spectroscopy lab home page usgs spectroscopy lab even there the typical spectral curves given for magnetite are not really good uh, there is no good uh, absorption feature i should say in the nir region however for hematite yes well defined absorption uh, features are there and it is centered around 8, 865 nanometers very broad trough in the nir in a general way i can say but specifically around 865 870 nanometers the, and in hyperion if you are going to look at a curve of a ion ore region the best thing is do all the corrections try to get the curve and try to see which is the deepest part of the trough and that is the actual absorption for ion ore of that region i think that will be the best answer thank you we have uh, another question that says is there any unique spectral signature for minerals through hydrocarbon alteration uh, i am not able to understand this question because uh, i'm i'm sorry i'm not able to understand minerals getting altered through hydrocarbon alteration this is a new concept i'm i'm not very clear about the question uh, if uh, the student is trying to ask what what is the signature for areas where hydrocarbon seepage is there maybe that can be answered there are well defined nir visible nir and short wave and to be specific uh, it depends on the soil type available there and the coating the, i i cannot give specific answer to this because two things the answer question doesn't seem to be clear and uh, for hydrocarbon it is an organic material and organic materials generally uh, exhibit well defined spectra in the uv region rather than the uh, visible and uh, nir region i should say okay that's another question which says is there any precise signature either in reflectance or absorption for differentiating silicates in my lecture even in spectroscopy lecture and today in mineral exploration lecture uh, i was telling you that uh, generally we were talking only from visible to short wave infrared but if you look at the thermal region 3 nanometers to 16 nanometers you have excellent signatures for silicates silicate dominant minerals and silicates in especially in the thermal and there are studies that are coming up slowly in terms of imaging uh, i'm sorry uh, there are not many minerals but uh, uh, sensors but aster has got five bands in the thermal region meant to map silicate minerals and radiometers currently available radiometers operate uh, spectro radiometers operate uh, from 400 nanometers to 2500 nanometers but for silicates we are talking of 3000 to 16000 nanometers and for that we have certain 
Fourier transform infrared FTIR spectrometers that are currently available in the market and they will give very good signatures in the thermal region for silicate minerals. As I told you, USGS spectroscopy website by Clark, Roger Clark gives excellent information about or a better answer than me about your question. Thank you very much. Next question is, can we explore petroleum well at North Pole or Siberia area and under sea through hyperspectral remote sensing? Very difficult question to answer, but the, what I should say is, people have tried to use hyperspectral sensing to look for oil slick. There is a difference between oil spill and spill is oil spill in the sea is what happens from ships. Ships when they leak out oil on the surface is called oil spill. But naturally below the uh, sea or the, or the bottom of the sea if there are certain openings through which hydrocarbons leak out and they because of the density difference they come out to the uh, sea surface and uh, they form big circular masses they are called oil pancakes a pancake is more like a dosa a very big dosa i should say these oil pancakes have well defined signatures uh, more so in the visible region certain parts of the nir region uh, no, not well defined i should say in the nir but in the visible certain, uh, and uh, in the short wave depending on the nature of the uh, currents and other things. There, if there is chlorophyll also in the uh, sea water, then it could, could differ a little. But however, yes, the answer is it is possible to use hyperspectral remote sensing to identify what are known as oil sleeks, S L E E K, on the sea surface, which perhaps is an underwater or uh, sea bottom oil hydrocarbon uh, resource that are that has come up through a two or three kilometer column of water on the surface. And uh, there are two things we need to look at this, not simply the spectral character of the floating oil because it could be the same as an oil spill from a ship, but the circular shape as I told you oil pancake as it is called. And if this relates to a known seismic anomaly there or a known gravity anomaly there, then we can certainly tell that it is due to a natural hydrocarbon deposit there. Thank you. Uh, here is another question, other than mineral quality discrimination, can we also use hyperspectral remote sensing for urban development and environmental management? I am uh, not sure about this uh, question because uh, I am not, not a person who applies remote sensing for urban development or, but if you look at uh, You see, for urban development, we are looking at man-made features, well-defined man-made features and for, uh, for this, we only need to have high spatial resolution image. When we talk of hyperspectral sensing, we are talking of high spectral resolution images. Um, to me, even a simple panchromatic but hyperspectral, sorry, hyperspatial, that is we are talking of either QuickBird or Iconos or uh, our own uh, Cartosat images can give very good information about urban development rather than uh, hyperspectral images. And for environmental management, yes, very well. Water quality mapping, uh, quality of uh, coastal waters, quality of uh, lake water, then pollutants in river water, everything can be excellently mapped using hyperspectral uh, sensing. There are many case studies that have been carried out, especially in Europe, for uh, Water, uh, water quality mapping and then uh, habitat mapping as far as environmental and ecological applications, applications are concerned. Habitat mapping, uh, trying to look for uh, definite species, communities and to some extent whether there is a climax status happening there, what are the communities present in, uh, in, in an ecological succession mapping, people have attempted using hyperspectral remote sensing. Thank you please. There is another question. How to identify, uh, what? no that is over, okay, how to identify petroleum in North Pole area where there is thick layer of ice and there will be no oil slick. Uh, I am sorry this is going more towards geophysics. With ice cover 
in the north pole i am not sure i am i have not come across any case study that indicates uh, petroleum seep through ice covers in the north pole area so i am afraid i may not be able to answer this question sorry there is one more question coming up it says among the airborne and space borne sensors which can give more effective result for mineral exploration we know very well that uh, if you are talking as people who have access to airborne hyperspectral data then we should say avris is the best known sensor then you have casi 1 casi 2 Avris, Casi one, Casi two. These are all very good sensors that have high spatial and spectral and also radiometric resolution to give us excellent information about hydrothermally altered regions, carbonates, iron ores, limonites, bauxites, what not. Everything, most of the minerals that have very good spectral response in the visible and short wave regions can be mapped excellently using Avris. In fact, Avris was. the primary reason for mapping uh, making everest was one of the primary reasons was mineral exploration it was a uh, joint uh, exercise between the usgs and uh, nasa jet propulsion laboratory as far as space borne we all know that we have very few sensors uh, uh, space borne hyperspectral sensors hyperion is certainly good for mineral mapping but if you are uh, talking in a very general term we all know that uh, or we must be knowing by this time that uh, mineral mapping of the lunar surface has been attempted using two hyperspectral sensors one is called hisai on board chandrayaan 1 which uh, maps the minerals in the visible and near infrared region then we have one dedicated sensor called m cube triple m or m cube or moon moon mineralogy mapper which can map from 400 to 3000 nanometers typically as the name itself indicates it's called moon mineralogy mapper it's got 300 bands a very good hyperspectral sensor dedicated only for mineral mapping but not on the earth surface but on the lunar surface i think that answers your question thank you okay i think we are uh, deviating for uh, from mineral exploration here is another question that says what would be the band width for water quality mapping see when it comes to water quality water Uh, we are talking more of uh, blue and blue green okay that's where uh, the reflectance occurs and uh, the nar is uh, of less use i should say for water quality mapping but blue and blue, blue green uh, because we, uh, nowadays we also have the uh, we have dedicated bands for water quality mapping uh, but when it comes to bandwidth i should i'm afraid i'm not uh, very good in water quality mapping but always a narrow band uh, say even uh, uh, 20 nanometers should be okay for uh, band, band. if you are looking for chlorophyll a there is a given band bandwidth if you are looking for chlorophyll b there is a given bandwidth if you are looking for suspended sediments there is a given bandwidth okay because this doesn't happen to be my domain i am afraid i won't be able to give specific answer as to which band is for chlorophyll a or b or c uh, had it been minerals i can tell you for which mineral what is the bandwidth thank you i think uh, uh, that is it for the day thank you for uh, staying